Now I'm going to show you fellows something, Don Juan said casually. I thought he was going to let us see some power objects he had in his pouch. Don Juan stood up and walked around the big boulder until he was out of sight. Then suddenly, he stepped out from behind the boulder. I had a moment of bewilderment. Don Juan had put on a funny black hat. It had peaks on the side, by the ears. It was round on the top. It occurred to me that it was actually a pirate's hat. He was wearing a long black coat with tails, fastened with a single shiny metallic button. He even had a peg leg. I laughed to myself. Don Juan really looked silly in his pirate's costume. I began to wonder where he had gotten the outfit, out there in the wilderness. I assumed he must have hidden it behind the rock. All Don Juan needed was a patch over his eye and a parrot on his shoulder to be the perfect stereotype of a pirate. Don Juan looked at every member of the group, sweeping his eyes slowly from right to left. Then he looked up and stared into the darkness behind us. He remained in that position for a moment, and then he went around the boulder and disappeared. I didn't notice how he walked on a peg leg. I was so mystified by his acts, I didn't pay attention to details. I expected Don Juan to step out from behind the boulder right away and sit down again, but he didn't. He remained out of sight. I waited impatiently. The young men were sitting with an impassive look on their faces. I couldn't understand what Don Juan had intended with the costume. After a long wait, I turned to the young man on my right and asked him in a low voice if any of the objects that Don Juan had put on, the funny hat and the long tail coat and the fact he was standing on a peg leg, had any meaning to him. The young man looked at me with a funny, blank expression. He seemed confused. I repeated my question and the other young man next to him looked at me attentively in order to listen. They looked at each other in seemingly utter confusion. I said that to me, the hat and the stump and the coat made him into a pirate. By then, all four young men had come together close around me. They giggled softly and fretted nervously. They seemed to be at a loss for words. The most daring of them finally spoke. He said that Don Juan didn't have a hat on, nor was he wearing a long coat, and he certainly wasn't standing on a peg leg, but that he had on a black cowl or a shawl over his head and a jet black tunic like a friar's that went all the way to the ground. No, another young man exclaimed softly. He didn't have a cowl. That's right, the others said. The young man who had spoken first looked at me with an expression of total disbelief. I told them we had to review what happened very carefully and that I was sure Don Juan wanted us to do so and thus he had left us alone. The young man who was to my extreme right said that Don Juan was in rags. He wore a tattered poncho and a beat up sombrero. He was holding a basket with some things in it. The young man who had seen Don Juan with a black cowl said he had nothing in his hands, but his hair was long and wild, as if he were a wild man that had just killed the friar and put on his clothes but couldn't hide his wildness. The young man to my left chuckled softly and commented on the weirdness of it all. He said that Don Juan was dressed as an important man who had just gotten off his horse. He had leather leggings for horseback riding big spurs, a whip that he kept beating on his left palm, and two 45 caliber pistols. He said that Don Juan was the picture of a well-to-do ranchero. The fire was about to be extinguished when Don Juan came out from behind the boulder. We better leave the young men to their doings. Bid them goodbye. He didn't look at him. He began to walk away slowly to give me time to say goodbye. The young men embraced me. There were no flames in the fire but the live coals reflected enough glare. Don Juan was like a dark shadow a few feet away, and the young men were a circle of neatly defined static statues. It was at that point that the total event had an impact on me. A chill ran up my spine. I caught up with Don Juan. He told me in a tone of great urgency not to turn around and look at the young men, because at that moment, they were a circle of shadows. My stomach felt a force coming from the outside. It was as if a hand had grabbed me. I screamed involuntarily. Don Juan whispered that there was so much power in the area, it would be very easy for me to use the gate of power. We jogged for hours. I fell down five times. Don Juan counted out every time I lost my balance. Then he came to a halt. Sit down, huddle against the rocks, and cover your belly with your hands, he whispered in my ear. As soon as there was enough light in the morning, we started walking. Don Juan guided me to the place where I had left my car. I was hungry, but I felt otherwise invigorated and well rested. We ate some crackers and drank some bottled water I had in my car. I wanted to ask him some questions that were overwhelming me, 
but he put his fingers to his lips. By mid-afternoon, we were at the border town where Don Juan had wanted me to leave him. We went to a restaurant to eat lunch. The place was empty. We sat at a table by a window, looking out at the busy main street, and ordered our food. Don Juan seemed relaxed. His eyes shone with a mischievous glint. I felt encouraged and began a barrage of questions. I mainly wanted to know about his disguise. I showed you a little bit of my not doing. But none of us saw the same disguise. How did you do that? It's all very simple. They were only disguises. Because everything we do is in some way merely a disguise. A Toltec warrior can hook himself to everyone's doing and come up with some weird things. But they are not weird. Not really. They are only weird to those who are trapped in doing. Those four young warriors and you yourself are not yet aware of not doing. So it's easy to fool all of you. But how did you fool us? It won't make sense to you. There's no way for you to understand it. Try me, Don Juan, please. When we are born, we bring with us a little ring of power. That little ring is almost immediately put to use. So every one of us is already hooked from birth. Our rings of power are joined to everyone else's. Our rings of power are hooked to the doing of the world in order to make the world. For instance, our rings of power, yours and mine, are hooked right now to the doing in this room. We are making this room. Our rings of power are spinning this room into being at this very moment. Wait, this room is here by itself. I'm not creating it. I have nothing to do with it. Don Juan didn't seem to be concerned with my protests. He very calmly maintained that the room we were in was brought into being and was kept in place because of the force of everybody's ring of power. You see, every one of us knows the doing of rooms, because in one way or another, we have spent much of our lives in rooms. A man of knowledge, on the other hand, develops another ring of power. I would call it the ring of not doing, because it's hooked to not doing. With that ring, therefore, he can spin another world. I begged him to explain. But I've just explained it to you. You mean you didn't put on any disguise? All I did was hook my ring of power to your own doing. You yourself did the rest, and so did the others. That's incredible, I exclaimed. We've been taught to agree about doing. You have no idea of the power that agreement brings with it. Fortunately, not doing is equally magical and powerful. 